Manchester, New Hampshire. That's right. Myself and my co-host, Alderman at Large, Joe Kelly Levesque. Thank you very much, sir. Nice to see you. Uh, welcome, everybody, to a live broadcast. We are waiting for Francis Frank Ginta to show up and uh, have a discussion about the campaign and what's going on. Yes. How many weeks do we have left? We have one show left. That's correct. One this show, show left. and one more. Yeah, the March to November is uh, the name of the show that it should be. And as soon as we're done with this uh you know, as soon as the election's over, we'll be right back at it next, uh, the, the Wednesday after the election to go over it and talk about it and cry in our soup or maybe celebrate. Who knows uh, what's going to how it's going to turn out. And uh, as we all know, Donald Trump is uh, is seems to be closing the, the uh, closing the gap. Uh, Fox News has a poll out. He's only down three points. That's nationally. If, that's if you're paying attention to those polls. I think the whole key here is going to be the privacy of the voting booth. When people walk into that voting booth, they close the curtain behind them, I think you're going to see uh, a m much different figures. But, hey, that's just me. Who really yeah. knows? You know? We got uh, oh, the, the congressman is here as we speak, and uh, he's been here before. Actually, he's one of the guys that helped build this baby yeah. and put this all together as our former mayor. Welcome, Francis. Hi. How are you? Looking good. Glad fit? you could make it. Good to be here. Losing weight on the paleo diet. I'm trying. I'm how's trying. That, how's, that, how's that work? Well... Today, not so well. <laughs> to be honest with you, I was at Dunkin' Donuts and got my yeah, well, favorite vanilla cream. Diet, so it's worse, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. There's about yeah. five. There's like, got to be one on every corner on every street. So my basically what I'm trying to do is no pasta, which is a little tough yeah, for for, for, yeah. for, for yeah. times. Yeah, but yeah. but no, I'm trying to do no um, no pasta, no breads, no dairy. Uh, you know, no potato, no rice. So you just basically have fish, uh, chicken or meat, and then salad and proteins so eggs um <clears throat> can have some tuna fish things like that and when i when i'm doing it it works but you know yeah, these days are a little tough i'm on the road yeah it's not easy to yeah i've been on the, on the road. diet i dropped down from 197 down to 187 and this i last night i broke down and i had a nice piece of fish but i put it on pasta i woke up this morning gained 1.2 pounds there you go just pasta. like that it's pasta and it really tasted good yeah. and i'm like I'm oh sure man but i get you it's pasta, man. It's bread, pasta, you can't, sugar. I, I mean, I can't live without it. I, I, gotta, I, gotta, I gotta, the Mediterraneans live routinely into their 90s and their sure, 100s. Sure, you know? It's a red wine, I guess, and the olive oil. Hey, listen, I... <laughs> Maybe we gotta add some red wine to our meal. Before we get going here, I, I was gonna make an announcement before you showed up, and I, we're gonna, I'm gonna get to this call, but I don't want this announcement to go by the wayside. It's very important. I have a public service announcement. Weekly yard waste pickup is in effect till December 22nd for the city of Manchester, okay? So from now to December 2nd, you don't have to worry. Did you put the yard waste out last week? Or was it next week? It's, it's every week for the yard waste, okay? And I just wanted to get that out there. So Thank you for that reminder. Right? I appreciate yeah, that because I've right. got to do my, See, yeah, my, you don't my have lawn. To, you this last my yard. Yeah. Yeah. November 9th, well, I've been trying to do it for three weeks now. Yeah. And between yeah. Yeah. you know the yeah. campaign and then a couple of days where it rained, and, uh, How's it happening? No, the weekends have been tough. Yeah. Uh, call us in the lifeblood of the show. We have one on hold. You want to take it? Sure, them? yeah, absolutely. Get it on and uh, <laughs> keep them coming. I think we have Larry on the line. Larry, get in there with your question or comment for Congressman Frank Ginta. Hey, uh, Ed, Joe, and hello, uh, Congressman. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to bring up. I was watching the Brett Bear show tonight uh, on Fox, and uh, Kelly Ayette was on, and he asked her who she was going to vote for, and she said she was going to write in Mike Pence. I mean, she really is a coward. I'm going to call her office up tomorrow and tell her that I'm going to write in Ivanka Trump and I'm not vote for her. Uh, I'm also disappointed in the Republicans. And uh, you too, Congressman. I see Donald Trump out there on the campaign trail. He's the only one on the stage or else he's got his children with him. He's all out there. He's out there by himself, but he's, he's getting these big crowds. You see Hillary Clinton out there. The Democrats are standing behind her. I'm just so di uh, disappointed in the Republican Party uh, from the top on down. And just come out and say you want Trump. He will. And uh, I, I did. Hard on it. I, uh, Kelly's so afraid of not getting elect re-elected. Sure. I tell you, I'm calling her office up tomorrow, and I'm going to I'm going to tell her I'm going to write in Ivanka Trump's name instead of voting for her. I was going to vote for her, but when I saw her on Fox tonight. She just, she's a coward. All right, Larry, let's go. Thank you, Larry. Now, Frank, yeah, no, thanks for the call, Larry. Larry, I actually endorsed Donald Trump back in May, and um, I, I have stood with him uh, through the course of uh, this campaign. And just three weeks ago, I was in Laconia 
with Donald Trump on stage um, speaking right before uh, he did speak. So I, I welcome him back to New Hampshire. He's coming yeah, Friday. Yeah, generally when, he, when, when we go to his events, we don't get to sit on a stage. He doesn't have no, a yeah, seat behind you're, you're us. Because right. I've been to about four, yeah. three or four of them. And Hillary Clinton was just here this weekend, uh, this last couple days over at St. A's. She actually walked onto the stage with Governor Hassan, with Shea Porter, with um, Ooh, crazy Warren, uh, Elizabeth Warren, and I think even with um, Annie Custer. So, but Donald Trump's campaign stops have not been like that. So it's not because people don't want to support. Oh, really? I didn't know that. No, they, okay. every campaign's different. Uh, their preference is for speakers to speak ahead of time. And then he comes out on stage on his own. You so have that's typically, yeah, sure. When, we, when he came to the Radisson, which they didn't film that part of it, I was you there. and I, you sure, and I, I was were there. there. We got to meet him one on one. Yeah, we did. And what's really interesting is when you, when Mitt Romney, if you wanted to meet in the VIP room, you paid thousand bucks. Yeah. He didn't charge a dime. No. We were there, and he literally talked to each one of us yes. for a couple of minutes. Yeah. And then you went out and spoke ahead of him and got the crowd, you know, talked to the crowd, and then uh, you came out and uh, you won your race against uh, Ashu by a couple hundred. It was the 7,800 votes. Oh, so it was yeah. that high, okay. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you, you, do you attribute that to sticking with Trump? And I, I attribute it to hard work, and people know what, what my focus and attention has been. And I made it clear back in May that I was uh, supportive of the ticket and the nominee, and there were other Republicans who chose not to do so. My feeling is this. You know, he is the... The duly elected nominee of the Republican Party. I fought one. And I fought one. He did, yeah. and he won it fair and square. So let's get behind the ticket and the nominee. Um, does that mean I agree with everything he has said? Of course not. But uh, look, we have a binary choice: we have Donald Trump or we have Secretary Clinton. And for those who are still undecided, I invite you to look at the policy. Forget about the, the yes, campaign the tactics, the campaign stunts. Yeah. Yeah. Forget about From the negative the attacks. Theatrics. Just put that aside for a moment and think about the policy differences between the two. And and that's what I convey to people who are undecided. Border security. I, I watched the last debate, and the one thing that always worries me, uh, particularly as a former mayor of our city here, uh, median income in our city is about 55000 per family, not per individual, per family. Right. Uh, we don't have the resources that a Greenwich, Connecticut does or, you know, a Rye or a Bedford. So, you know, we've got to be thoughtful about taxpayers. Um, Hillary Clinton said that she was not going to raise taxes on anybody who was making under $250,000. That was in the beginning of the debate. Toward the end of the debate, she then announced, and no reporter picked up on this, but she announced the largest tax hike uh, in history, which would be the increase in the Social Security tax. That would impact every employer and every single person who's employed in America. So we're talking about the middle class, the working class. We're talking about our city. And that has nothing to do with Obamacare. No, that's in addition. That's, that's in, in addition that's to President Obama just announcing this week that premiums are going up on average at 25%. So when I think about the days that I was...
permanent under the Bush tax cuts, uh, but then there were other increases in those taxes. I felt that that was going to be uh, negative to the economic growth. What have we seen since? On average, 1% economic growth. That is anemic at best. So when people talk about the average uh, uh, weekly wage in the state of New Hampshire or across the country over the last six, eight years, it has not gone up in almost every single sector. The unemployment rate has come down, but it doesn't mean that you're making the same money today that you were making six, eight months ago. So you don't have the consumer confidence. Um, you don't have uh, the ability to provide uh, the services for your family or the products that you need to purchase. Or what most people want is to buy a home, send their kids to college. You don't have that ability. The American dream. The American dream. You just don't have it. And that's because, you know, when you raise taxes, you're taking more money out of individuals' pockets. We spend three, we take in $3.2 trillion. I would think most people watching tonight would think, you know, we think the federal government could probably run a three point two trillion, maybe even a little bit less. We're we're spending three point eight trillion. Taking it, I mean, three point two trillion dollars is not enough. Boy, do they need a tax cap? Like we have. In the you know, look, the tax cap. Uh, you know, I, I hear different perspectives, different opinions. What I think it does more than anything is force people, elected officials and bureaucrats, the people who are unelected, to be more efficient with taxpayer dollars, be more respectful of the people, the hardworking people of our city. That's the approach that I think the next president should take. That's the approach I took. That's the approach you take. And I appreciate that, that when, when someone's going to be uh, aware of other people's money and they're going to try to put that money back into the, into the hands of that individual. You mentioned Obamacare, okay? It's, it's, it's a disaster. It's a train wreck. Very quickly, I want to ask you, what do we do here? Do we, yeah. do we just dismantle it completely, or what? How do you, where do we go? Well, well look, I don't believe can, in can the, First of all, can Trump, do by an executive order, do anything, or does that it, have to In my opinion, he can, uh, by just because of how the Affordable Care Act was passed. I, I don't think it was passed legally, but that we went to court, and that was... Uh, that was addressed by the by the Supreme Court. I disagree with the decision, but I honor it. If you got rid of the penalty, then it wouldn't pass constitutional muster Correct. because they said that the reason Correct. why it passed, passed constitutional muster is because of the penalty, which, by the way, nobody's talking about. I had to bring it up to mm -hmm. Eric Trump, who was at the restaurant yesterday. What they don't realize is the poor guy who's making four or $500 a week and gets a certain amount taken out of their check every month, and they expect to get a good portion of that back in January when they get their W-2. They, you know, they file their tax returns and they get back a check somewhere in the 400 to $600 range and maybe more if you have dependents that you can write off, etc. They're not going to get that back or most of it back because if you don't have health insurance, this year it's $695 for a penalty. That's going to kill the economy in a different way because that money is going to go back to the debt and the hole that we can't ever fix or won't or no one will fix but it also takes away so much money that those people will use in the springtime maybe go on a small trip go to the mall fix their car pay for bills it's gone yeah the, nobody the, talks about no no you're, you're right and I'm glad you brought it up because you either have to take uh, the Affordable Care Act, the uh, health insurance on the Affordable Care Act, which is unaffordable. Right now, Miniman which Health is they announced, they announced uh, a 42% increase because of the mandates within Minuteman, the... Miniman, that's... A, is that, where's that? Uh, who's affected? Oh, well, they, so they run one of the exchanges in the city, in the, in the state of New Hampshire. In the state of New Hampshire, okay. So, so they, they... And I'm not picking on them. I mean, using yeah, them right. as an Just example, they're, they're, yeah. they, they're a good company. The, the reality is that... Um, because of the requirements of the Affordable Care Act, they are increasing their rates 42% to about, for a family of four, 1200 per month. So here, how do, you, how do you get, how is that affordable when your median income is $55,000 a year? That's just not affordable. So now you're paying the penalty and you're uninsured. That was not the goal and objective when this started. So where do we go from here? So we... look, I, I, to me, this is the problem with a government-run approach, government-run health care. This is very simple. You as a consumer should be able to purchase the kind of insurance you want. As simple as that. Let's start with that. Cafeteria style? It should be cafeteria style. Absolutely. You purchase the things that you think are... I'm not going to need a sex change operation, so I don't want to pay for that coverage. You don't need to pay for dog biting stuff. Yeah, right? I mean, no, nor are, are are you going to have to, you know, I don't I don't think you're going to have the baby, so... No, I don't, no, I don't. I, I mean, 
Okay. So if you have choice, so let's start with what happens with people who are already receiving a benefit under the Affordable Care Act. You're not going to throw them off of health insurance. You're going to give them a bridge to get, you know, 12, 18, 24 months to provide that move from the Affordable Care Act into either a high-risk pool if they don't have employment. So for that person that doesn't have employment, let's do the responsible thing, get them properly trained and into the workforce so they can find employer-based health insurance, and then they should have that cafeteria-style plan. We have to be thoughtful and sensible about the money that's being spent at the federal level. We have nine different agencies right now that provide, through 18 different programs, opportunities for training dollars. It should be under one agency where a committee of jurisdiction in the House and the Senate have the ability to have oversight to make sure that those dollars are following the individual who's unemployed, get them from point A to point B so they can have that job opportunity to health care, to get off of government assistance, to get off of that reliance of the federal government. But this president, and I don't think Hillary Clinton would do it either. How is D.C. handling the issue of the WikiLeaks 50,000 pedestrian emails? Is that affecting their campaign? Is it affecting Washington? You see the Hillary campaign behind everybody's back and these emails throwing a lot of people under the bus. Have you any insight into what's going on with that? I mean, is it, I guess it basically proved what everybody, all Americans were always concerned about was the corruption. The fact that they were talking about the Venezuelan girl four or five, six months ago, setting him up, Trump, and planning these things and manipulating the press by spoon feeding them, Donna Brazile handing her questions before debates. I mean, what does that do for the whole idea of government in the first place? You know, my fear is that the mainstream media is not covering this the way they should. I think it's a legitimate story. I'm not suggesting don't cover Donald Trump. What I am suggesting is cover both candidates equally. And I think most people in America, regardless of party affiliation, would say, yeah, that's fair. I mean, cover them both. And what I'm reading through the emails that are being leaked, first of all, the Hillary Clinton campaign is not saying these aren't ours. I mean, that's number one. But some of the things that are being stated, as well as the Project Veritas information where the undercover guy goes in and films these people. I mean, one guy lost his job over it. They were inciting violence. They admitted it on videotape. And then they have the duck thing now, the new duck. Right. All these ducks that they were spending out were actually planned by Mrs. Clinton herself. According to the video. Let me ask you, why is Congress so weak? They subpoena somebody, they don't show up. Do you not have, what are the powers of Congress? You have subpoena power. Where's the regulator, Frank? You know, the, well, I mean, look, once upon a time, if there was, you know, you hate to think about being subpoenaed by Congress, but if you were subpoenaed by Congress, you'd show up. Now, you have a right to invoke your Fifth Amendment right, but that being said, you're still supposed to be showing up. I, it's frustrating at the very least. And I think America is seeing a changing governance. And that, I think, is frightening a lot of people. And there's a lot of frustration. So, you know, there's a couple of weeks left here, a little less than a couple of weeks left. People need to make an informed decision about who they want. I think you want good, honest, decent people who are going to fight for the right public policy and issues, work across the aisle. You know, I've been able to do that. I haven't changed my principles, but I've gotten six pieces of legislation signed into law by this president. Uh, in, including the deferral of the Cadillac tax, which was a main uh, piece of the President's Affordable Care Act. You guys know what that would have done to the city of Manchester had it, had it continued to, to be implemented. It would have been a $5 million hit to the taxpayers of the city. It would have been a 2.5% tax, tax increase. If I were the mayor, I'd put right on there Cadillac tax, right on your bill, so people right. know. right. right. Just so people at least know where it's coming from. But we were able to delay that, and we got the President of the United States to agree that it was bad public policy. I think Manchester, I think the state, wants people who are willing to fight for the right principles and then find Democrats to join us and get things done.
What's, the, uh, what, what's next on the campaign? We have 12 days. This is being uh, the Wednesday. I mean, it's literally coming down to 12 days. It, it, it takes forever, but then it comes so quick. It comes quickly. And then you're like, oh, oh did I do enough? I, I am spending uh, each and every day traveling around the district, meeting as many people as I possibly can, uh, talking about the message of, of leadership, the things that I've debates? accomplished. Yes, we have the, the MUR debate is uh, next week. and Three. Yeah, so we had the BIM debate uh, this week, and Sean O'Connor was in, uh, Cal Shea Porter and myself. It was the first time, actually, that Sean O'Connor and, and Cal Shea Porter were on the same debate stage, because, as, as you know, Sean O'Connor was running as a Democrat in the Democrat primary, um, and, and essentially he was forced out of that primary because of how he was treated by Cal Shea Porter and the leadership in the Democratic Party. So he's now running as an independent, but he is a self-identified progressive, true progressive, he calls himself, uh, who endorsed Bernie Sanders. And when you start to look at his policy positions, I've met him a number of times now, nice enough guy, but when you look at his policy positions, they're, they're really no different than Cal Shea Porter's uh, in many respects. So I, I think they are really coming to the same He should have ran in the primary. primary. He would have clocked her. I mean, he was... Uh, uh, he, he, he tried to run in the primary, and I, I, I think that he personally feels like he was pushed out of that primary. He said it on the show last he week. He did. That he was okay. locked and told that he knew if he ran, it would have been rigged against him, mm. and he wouldn't have gotten a fair shot. Uh, I mean, he's, he's really a... He's, and he's, he's a, a true progressive... Twice. Even on the, on the ballot law commission, right, sure. On the ballot they, they, commission. So right. after he gets kicked out of the Democratic primary, the Democratic leadership uh, in New Hampshire, um, and I say leadership because I know Democrats who, who are friends of mine who are angry that this is how he was treated. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, they, they then try to kick him off the ballot, not once but twice, all designed because they were concerned with, I mean, talk about access to candidates. So I would want to step up and say, no, he should have a say. Uh, and and he should. And he, I mean, he's running a legitimate campaign. Uh, again, the policy issues are, are absolutely completely different than mine. He's, you know, almost mirrors Carol Shea Porter, but that's why she doesn't want him in the debates for the well, general election. You had election. a good line. You said you were there. Some reason they put you in the middle of the two guys. They're fighting each other, going back and forth. You feel like you're you're actually the moderator for the for the Democratic for the debate. Democratic that was debate yeah. I don't know if the audience laughed or if there was an audience there. There wasn't a live audience, but yeah. I, but I, I got a lot of people emailing yeah. me. And, and, what, and that me. was the NH1 debate. That was the NH1 debate. Uh, you know, Paul and Kiki Vensel did a great job. Uh, they they had a phenomenal debate. We we stuck to the policy issues, which was. Do you wonderful. feel like them two being on there can just go after you the whole time? It's two on one. You know, I wasn't sure. Well, I've been used to that. First of all, I mean. Let, let's start with that. I mean, I, I've been in different debates, primary in general, where, where I'm always attacked. I tend to be uh, the front runner. I mean, I, I always kind of run as if I'm not, but but that's ten tends to what happened. This debate, it was interesting to see the two of them more clash uh, because they were both trying to attract the same vote. I tried to stay above it, um, showed the differences or the similarities between uh, Mr. O'Connor and Ms. Shea Porter. Uh, and then talked about my mission of accomplishment, you know, being chairman of the Congressional uh, Heroin and Opioid Task Force, getting $192 million a year for the next five years passed by the CARA legislation, six bills signed into law um, by this President of the United States in this term alone. Not, not many people can say, uh, and believe me, President Obama and I don't agree on much, but I was able to work with him and Democrats to get things accomplished on behalf of the state of New Hampshire for our fishing industry, repeal of the Cadillac tax, uh, EPA mandates, I mean, things that were really impacting our How about the emails that the, the president said he never knew that Hillary Clinton had a private server, and it came out today that um, he, in fact, did know, and her attorney said, we need to clean this mess up because he knows that not all of her emails that came to her said state.gov. Is that just a... Um, uh, is that is that not a big deal? It is a big deal. It, it, it is a big deal. Uh, so when you're when you're Secretary of State, uh, you, you, first of all, you don't get classified information to your BlackBerry or your iPhone. You have to go yeah. to a separate uh, a, a separate computer on a separate server because of the fact that it's classified. So the fact that she is emailing with the President of the United States uh, from her private server. Uh, which may have been hacked, uh, means that email exchanges between the President of the United States and the Secretary of State could have been hacked. That That is a problem, well, a fundamental problem. So the, you got the President of the United States who's saying that he didn't know that he was receiving emails.
emails. Is there anything that occurred that he's on his way out seven weeks and nobody does anything about it? It just he's been off the trail now when he was on the trail hard. Now he's not been on for 48 hours. He kind of took a nosedive. Is it a coincidence that they came out and told us about the premiums going up? No. Obamacare? No. So he leaked that because he's sick and tired of Bill Clinton smashing Obamacare around. No. The open enrollment starts November 1st and you've got to provide the public. So by the graces of luck, that is one of the biggest issues that people are talking about and it timed it just right to help. It's helping Donald Trump. Here's what I think. I think that when they first wrote the law, they thought that, as they said, premiums are going to decline. So I think they purposely put open enrollment on November 1st so they would have to notify right before an election that premiums are coming down. The exact opposite has happened. Did Carol Shea Porter vote for that or were you in Congress? Yes, no, she voted for it. She was in Congress. She voted for it. There wasn't a right Republican that voted for it. Not one Republican voted for the bill. She was in Congress at the time and voted for it. We have to pass it before we know what's in it. We have to pass it to know what's in it. This is just like a huge tidal wave. Is there any reason to think that's going to get better in a year or two or three? It's been five years years now and it hasn't gotten better you know it's it's now forty five dollars forty five hundred dollars more expensive it was supposed to be twenty five hundred less we were supposed to have more choice more options you have less your premiums are going up every year uh, and and your deductible is going up every single year. Do you find it odd that everything you just said is true right but yet Obama still has what a fifty five percent approval rating or something like that? Well he's on his way out you know why because how does that work? Well because he's on his way out people are not focusing on him they're focusing on the next election so typically what happens is your numbers as people don't focus on you your numbers are going to start to come back up. I think ultimately people will look at the Obama years and they're going to see a doubling of the debt. They're going to see the Affordable Care Act. The Middle East uh, crisis, the world. Yeah, I mean, apart. I think that's... Uh, that's Energy what, falling apart. You know, what's interesting is he really wants Hillary to get in there because actually Hillary will make him look like a good president. And that's how scary this is. He gets her in there. It doesn't, it, you know, just be, all these emails don't go away as soon as she gets sworn in. No, it's, 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 a, it's a problem. Yeah, the, 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 they don't tie up Congress for the House of Representatives. Uh, before you know, months ago, uh, referred another complaint to the FBI, and Director Comey accepted that the complaint. As far as I know, that's being considered right now. So, should she become president, she could be investigated. You'd have to have a special prosecutor, but now you'd have Hillary Clinton as the President of the United States directing the FBI. Oh yeah, so, when she gets in there, she's going to. But that complaint has been has been referred by the House of Representatives uh, before the election, and legitimately. And, and I don't know if you remember, but there was a moment where Director Comey was being questioned uh, by the committee, and I think it was I think it was Chairman Chaffetz who said, "Do you need a referral from Congress?" And it was almost as if Director Comey was asking for a right. referral, and and he said, "Okay." And so much more has come out since this system. thing, and then Hillary Clinton's emails are somewhere. Here's, here's the problem. People want to have faith in their government. They want to know that their government is doing everything it can to improve people's lives, to be efficient with taxpayer dollars, and to be open, transparent, and honest. And I don't think people feel like... Exactly. Law, law and order. order. People the don't feel like that. But it has, to be equal, it has to be equal across the board. It yes. can't be for some select people Correct. and then not other people. You know what's interesting? Call? Yeah, one call. Sure. We'll get time for it. All right, let's, let's get Mike in there. Mike, I don't have your last name. Go ahead with your question or comment. Uh, both. Okay. Let's get the comment. Okay, go ahead. You're on the air. Well, I just want to say I do appreciate uh, that Frank has uh, not taken the popular way and he has stuck with uh, Donald Trump, unlike Kelly Ayotte. Uh, I'm, I'm extremely angry at Kelly, the way she's handled herself through this whole thing. But, you know, these are all two people races. And the alternative to Donald Trump is Hillary Clinton. The alternative to Kelly Ayotte is Maggie Hassan. So I've got the handcuffs on that I have to vote for Kelly, yeah. even though I'm very angry at her. Yeah. But I do appreciate at least Frank had the backbone to stick with him because the alternative, again, is Hillary Clinton. So I, the other thing that I'm extremely angry about, and I just can't believe, even if you're a Democrat, you're not really angry and worried about it, is just the liberal media that you are talking about, 
that this is very dangerous. And, and today, I was listening to the radio, and evidently the early voting indicates in Florida and Ohio that Trump is winning. Not that they're neck and neck. The people who early voted, the absentee ballots, whatever you call it, he's, a, he's leading. He's winning. And none of that's reported on the nightly news. You don't hear any of that. So I think it's going to be people are going to go into their voting booth, and they're going to have to vote their conscience. Uh, you know, is this really the way you want the country going? And I think a lot of people are going to be closet Republican voters, and they're going to come out. And, and vote for Trump. I agree with you. I agree. Florida and Ohio showing that now. Yeah. The one thing I wanted to ask Frank was, because, you know, I am a re registered Republican, I'll be upfront about it, what is, you know, win or lose, what does Frank think the Republican Party is going to look like after this election? It's a really good question. It's a really good uh, question. Anyway. And I, I appreciate your question and your thoughts uh, and your comments. Uh, look, I think the Republican Party has got some soul-searching to do regardless of the outcome of the presidential election, uh, whether Mr. Trump wins or not. Um, and here's what – I'm a lifelong Republican. Um, I also care about our state and our country. What I want the Republican Party to espouse and, and to be uh, known for is the party of ideas, the party of opportunity, the party of upward mobility. In order to do that, we have got to have – unification within the party doesn't mean that we all have to agree on every single issue but I think we are a big tent party who cares largely about upward mobility uh, economic freedom and the improvement of everyone uh, regardless of where you come from or who you are this is the first uh, generation that thinks they're not going to be better off than the current one and that's frightening that's a frightening thought sure. in the greatest nation in the world right you know my my phone and I this and I put it in this context my folks didn't go to college. Uh, they started a small business. Uh, my mother still works. I mean, my dad only retired because he had health issues. But my mother actually, in her 70s, still works. Uh, that small business taught uh, me uh, a work ethic, an approach to uh, achieve the things that I wanted in life. It allowed me to have a great education. I appreciate that from my family. Um, and it's given me, my brother, and my sister opportunities that my folks didn't have. I'm the first in my family to go to college, to go to graduate school, to run for office, to serve in office. There are a lot of firsts that I'm proud of, but it's because of that ability to achieve the American dream. So Morgan and I look at our kids. Colby's 13 and Jack is 11. As a matter of fact, I just found out today that Colby is now part of student council, and I, I talked to her briefly about it before I came over here. And you should have seen the, the look on her face when I mentioned it. She got it, you know. She got a smile. She's got. They've got a big dance on Friday night, which doesn't make me smile, but you know, um, but she's got to get to the dance early yeah, because she's part of student council, yeah, and they've got to do the decorate. But just that one thing, that level of responsibility for a 13-year-old, is so incredibly important. And as a dad, I see that, and I say, that's the kind of thing that you want to see in your children. So, um, and I, my fear is that we're not achieving that. So what I, what I envision for the Republican Party is some soul-searching, uh, some, some willingness for people to say, despite the fact that maybe they disagree or don't like the nominee, that they, this is a team and this is a team effort. Well, let me Supreme tell you, I, you know, one of your greatest attributes that I've learned from knowing you since you've moved here is the ability to fluff off um, when people don't respect you or treat you with respect. Jennifer Horn uh, made statements, you know, wanted you not to be, want, didn't want you to run. You and I went to the Repu Bedford Republican um, gathering the day after the election. You and I sat with Sununu and Kelly Ayotte. Ellie Ayotte got up. You talked about team and working together, down ballot. I did the same. Sununu did the same. But Kelly Ayotte never mentioned your name. And still you have the, you have this ability to be able to just Focus, keep moving forward, and push those things behind you, even though I know they, they, they bother every normal human being, um, and you're able to do that. It, it's, it's, uh, it's a strength that you have that you're able to be able to work through these things. I, I'll tell you, um, but I tell you. It doesn't seem to be the same ideas with a lot of other people. In the I, I'll tell you where right? that comes from in me. So I'm the oldest of three, and my folks had very high expectations of me. 
Uh, and I have high expectations of myself, and I feel like I'm a fortunate guy. Um, I've got a great family. I've got a great extended family. And for a long time, the passion that uh, encouraged me to run, and I didn't talk about it until the last couple of years, uh, just because it was personal. Not that I didn't want it to. It was just personal. But it was my father battling a heart disease, my mother battling breast cancer, and, and a family member of mine having a mental illness, and how that impacted our family over the last 20 years. And I'm still the caregiver to that individual who, who lives here in our city. Um, that Those moments in my personal life uh, allowed me to focus on trying to help other people and be passionate about it. So... Um, I, I look at criticism that people will 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 levy, and I, I, they're entitled to their opinion. But it's not going to def- deter me from the goal and objective of helping other people. Because well, Hillary, people Sil- Hillary, Hillary Seeger just wrote a story on Facebook about the fact that she worked for and helped uh, Ashley. She did. And she called you because she was having a problem in a completely different state with a relative or a friend that was having some serious problems. Yeah. And you, she, 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 to this day, writes the story about how you didn't play games, you did not answer your phone, you did not not you know, bring up the issue of it. You just did your job the way you were elected to do it. And uh, Anne Marie Banfield, uh, I think it was another woman that uh, told the same story. There were people that went with this Ashu. You're not holding grudges. You're not playing games. You're like, you got a job. No, because guess what? My, I'm a member of Congress right now. My job is to help people. I cannot allow a campaign to get in the way of of, the, of, of the objectives of my job and the responsibilities of my job. So. Um, I, I, I appreciate you mentioning it, um, but what people get in me, someone who is hardworking, is going to help people um, as much as I possibly can, so long as I'm in public service. Frank, Frank, if I can, I want to switch gears just for a minute here, at the risk of boring the audience, perhaps. Where I want to talk at least briefly about foreign policy, uh, the Middle East. What, what's the deal there? Should we double down, triple down? Should we get out? Should we just keep doing what we're doing, or what? Uh, well, look, last week an American soldier died in Mosul. I don't know how many people caught that on the news, um, but an American soldier died um, trying to protect... Oh, they don't have any soldiers on the ground. Well, uh, if you... If you listen to Obama it, or Hillary... If it, it's... this, That's one of the things that frustrates me, because most people assume that there's a reduction in force, and slowly the president is increasing uh, the force, but he's not calling it what it is. Um, so you're saying he has been increasing the force? Yeah, the force slowly has been increasing by the president. Yeah, of the United we're States. still there. We're still have troops. Yes, we are. We, we so, so here's my so here's my point. If you're <laughs> going to have troops there, I mean, we haven't even had the public dis- discussion about whether we should have troops there or not. Right. Yeah. So let this is why I, I say we require leadership of the president to specifically outline what the goal and objective is, so the American people know, so Congress knows. We are charged with then paying for, uh, finding the money to implement that goal and objective. But we can't do that properly and fairly if we don't know what the goal and objective is. I don't want to send people into harm's way only to know that they're going to have minimal impact on the fight against ISIS and terrorism uh, and then lose American life. I don't want to see that. And I don't think any American wants to see that. Uh, So there's three or four things that need to be done. Number one, the president has to have a clear uh, plan. Then we need to have a vote on the use of uh, authorization of use of military force. So there's not uh, not the old one that he's working under, but a new one, and that can't happen until he tells us what he actually is looking for. Uh, then you need to um, let the generals on the ground implement what a plan for elimination of ISIS would be. Not not deterrence, but elimination. And I say that because they've expanded beyond the region into uh, into Europe and to the United States. And, that, and that, that's the fear, the concern that we all should have. You know, the fact that what happened in Orlando, 49 American citizens, uh, people, yeah. I don't know if they were all American citizens, right. but 40, I believe there are 49 Americans, died for no reason because of a terrorist attack on our soil. That should not happen. So in my view, you've got to take the fight to ISIS. You've got to eliminate ISIS. But that also requires our friends in the region to step it up and our allies around the world to step it up, not just the United States forces. How easy was the vote to uh, sue uh, Saudi Arabia? It was easy for me. Uh, we were talking about 9/11, families of 9-11 who lost loved ones, um, and they should have that right. Um, so uh, it, it, was, it was extremely bipartisan in the House and the Senate. 
Now, the president vetoed it, obviously, and we, we overrode the veto. But for me, it was a fairly easy thing to do. I thought the vote was pretty high. Senate vote was oh. 97 oh, votes. Yeah, Tim uh, Kaine was, uh, was 10 miles sure. away but couldn't make it to the meeting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and the House vote was, I, I forget the number, but it, I think... I think I believe we had a, a close to or over 400 votes. Well, it's symbolic, right? Because they're not going to pay up anyways. I mean, well, right? L to be determined. I mean, to be determined. But I mean, if you, if you lost somebody in 9/11, you should have the right to sue. You know, the perpetrator. If, if you know that the people that started it came out of the Saudi Arabian kind of out of Saudi Arabia, which I guess they've been able to prove that uh, there there was some sort of a connection connection yeah. there. So very interesting. And, and this was bipartisan in the House and the Senate. Extremely All right, we're going to let you take off. I know you got a staff meeting. If you want to talk to people, I know, you know, I, I, I don't see you going crazy with the sign thing. I mean, it looks like you know enough people. We have signs. No, we have signs. Uh, we, we, just had, we, like we just had sign? we just had a sign order of 500, and they went out the door like that. Right. So, uh, you know, I, I wish we had the resources to have 10,000 signs. Right. But we've got to be a little but, judicious. But your name our... recognition must be oh, pretty sure. high in the sure. district. Yeah, but we never take it for granted. I mean, right. we're, we've are we got a great gra gra uh, ground game. We're, we're, we make calls every day. We door knock every day. Um, you know, we, we want to make sure everybody has the opportunity to talk with me or someone from the team to, to have a question answered. Uh, I mean, most people know me and know my approach, but... Has the uh, Republican National Committee gotten involved in your race oh, yeah. and spent money on Oh, yeah, you, absolutely. You they have. So they consider this a targeted race? They believe that we can win, and, uh, you know, they feel we will win. And uh, they're, they're polls, uh, ridiculous uh, WMUR poll, the one that came Yeah, I, I, saw, I saw that. Uh, well, they had you the down 20 and me up 10, so I don't know if you're voting for Frank, how I would be. Well, in, in my rate, right, I don't know about yours, but in mine, they had oversampled uh, Democrats by about 12 and or 14 percent. They actually only called uh, 150 people. I mean, that was the UNH poll. Yeah, that's, that's so, just... I don't know if you two days, polls, three right? days later, well... There are a number of I – mean, look, I, I don't put a lot of stock in polls, to be honest, but uh, the, the, the way I determine how I think we're doing, the, the metric that we use internally, we feel we're, we're, we're in very, very strong position. And we also feel that Republicans are in a much stronger position than uh, the media is letting The on. real poll is on November 8th. That's the, the poll. poll but really, I, you know, yeah. The bottom line is people got to get out and vote. You know, It's the most important thing to come out and vote for the good people who are going to you know, have your best interest at heart. All right, thank you very much, Frank. Gidder. We'll be back in 60 seconds with the remainder of the show, talk a little about local issues, and uh, stay right there. Thanks. All right, I'll be right back. Frank Gidder.